Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, show number 88. Welcome to a real world MBA from the School of Hard Knocks, where entrepreneurs reveal what it really takes to make it. Whether you're already in business or you're on your way there, this show is for you. This is Bigger Pockets Business. How's it going, everybody? I am Jay Scott, your co-host for the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Here the last week of this crazy 2020, and I'm here once again with my lovely wife, Mrs. Carol Scott. How's it going today, Carol? I am super happy. I love the fact that this is episode 88. Eight is one of my favorite numbers, as I married the love of my life on 080808. Yep, sure did. And... We're wrapping up an amazing year, moving into a new fabulous year with two of our very favorite people in the whole entire universe on this show today. Absolutely. So I hope everybody caught that. Our anniversary is 080808. <laughs> Write it down because I want a gift next year from you guys. No, I'm just kidding. We do have an amazing show this week. We have, we're bringing back two people that um, probably are couple of our favorite shows ever. Uh, You probably know them well, Brandon Turner and David Green. They are co-hosts of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. And if you don't know Brandon or Turner, Brandon Turner or David Green, make sure you check out our episodes last year with them from 2019. And make sure you check out the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast because they have an amazing podcast. For those of you who do know Brandon and David, you know that this is going to be a great episode. We talk about all the things that went right in our businesses in 2020, not just real estate, but all of our businesses. We talk about the things that didn't go great in 2020 and how we can improve them in 2021. Brandon and David give some amazing advice on this episode. So we talk about how do you figure out what your superpower is? Basically that thing that's going to not just help you generate $100 an hour or $500 an hour, but maybe $10,000 or $50,000 an hour, literally. And Brandon gives an amazing example of that in this episode. Uh, We talk about when is it time to choose the right next venture for you? And how do you choose what that venture should be and what it shouldn't be uh, to really help jumpstart whatever it is you're doing? We talk about goal setting in the new year. Brandon talks about four ways to build persistence. So all of us, we, we're good at setting goals, but we're not necessarily as good at plowing through those goals and keep moving forward when times get tough. Brandon gives us four ways that we can really work on building our persistence. At the end of the show, we talk about finding a performance coach and how you might know if a performance coach is something you should need and how you find the right person to help you really build your 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 personal life, your business life, um, and just get so much better at everything you're doing. And make sure you listen to the very, very end of the show when David Green talks about why this podcast, the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast is absolutely his very favorite Bigger Pockets podcast. We're going to hold him to it, and but you have to hear why. Anyway, if you want to learn more about Brandon, if you want to learn more about David, if you want to learn more about anything we talk about on the show, please check out our show notes at biggerpockets.com slash bizshow88. Again, that's biggerpockets.com slash bizshow88. Okay, without any further ado, let's welcome two of our favorite people to the show, Brandon Turner and David Green. Brandon David, thank you so much for joining us at this awesome end of 2020. Got to tell you, this year has been a wild ride. So looking forward to hearing about everything that you've had on your plates and moving into the new year, all of us together. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you for having us. You know, I I made a bet to see if I could get on the show by the end of the year, and it looks like David owes me 50 bucks, so. (laughs) (laughs) So you guys are hanging out together in Hawaii, I assume? We we are. We're staying COVID safe right now. We're staring at each other in the eyes longingly as we talk. This is weird. It is awkward to try to think about what you're going to say with Brandon's big blue eyes, just like (laughs) enveloping your entire consciousness. He's so dreamy. That's what they say. That's why they call me Brandon uh, Dreamy Dreamy. Turner. Yeah, that's why they call me that. (laughs) Okay. I'm excited to have you guys here. So we could talk real estate all day and we do talk real estate all day, but we asked you here because we want to talk business. 
And yeah, real estate's business. I, I know all that. And so our real estate businesses are real businesses. But I want to hear about some of the other stuff you have going on. And, and so, um, Brandon, let's start with you. So let, sure. let, let's start with Open Door Capital, um, which I guess is a real estate business, but it's still a business. Tell us about that. Tell us what other stuff. What were you doing in 2020? Where were your focuses? How do you split up your time? I get this asked. I ask, get asked this question all the time. What do I spend my time on? Because people think of me as doing a million different things. I know people think of you the same way. What yeah. do you spend your time doing? I do a million different things, but no, uh, it's because, so I'll, I'll start with the first question. You asked like 12 questions there, Jay. I'm, I'm going to try I'm to remember a, all I'm, of them. I'm a bad uh, podcast host. No, you're a great podcaster. I just got to think through all these. Uh, let's see. So 2020, we grew from, I think at the beginning of the year, uh, Open Door Capital had zero team member, like employees. Uh, and we had, I don't, I think we had just closed our very first park and we had a few like volunteer, like intern helpers. And that was me and Ryan basically trying to run things. Uh, Ryan Murdoch, that is. And uh, we basically now have just crossed the thousand unit mark. I think we're at like a uh, thousand units. Uh, we have four full time, five full time staff now, uh, and it's been in a crazy, crazy year buying mobile home parks. So it's been it's been nuts. Uh, and I feel like I've grown more this year in business, like knowledge and ability in business, than like all other years combined. And like it was like I wish I could take this year and like. Uh, maybe I will write a book about it and then like send it in, into the past and then like, give it to myself when I was like 21. Cause I just feel like I learned so much stuff about what it means to run an actual business versus just, I can do everything. I got my real estate business and I'm going to do it all myself. So yeah, it's been a crazy year. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, and anything yeah. other than open door capital that you've been focusing on, obviously you're, you're VP at bigger pockets. And so you've got that going on, but any other yeah. uh, business endeavors besides, uh, besides those two big things? I've been doing a little bit of like affiliate marketing. Uh, and what I mean by that, if for those who are unfamiliar with affiliate marketing, is where you uh, send people, you recommend things, and then the company you recommend gives you a little bit of a kickback. Uh, I only do it with companies that I believe firmly and strongly in. Uh, so for example, um, I just got some new wall stuff from a company called Woodwall. Check them out. Uh, but no, I haven't, I haven't officially put it up yet. But this is like a fake wall. I got like this real like reclaimed wood wall. Uh, that I'm going to put up soon. And so they gave me free product in exchange for a shout out uh, and an Instagram video and a YouTube video I'm going to make. So that's been kind of interesting. Um, and I've done a couple more little things like that. Uh, I don't know. What else have I been doing business-wise? Have I been doing anything else? Well, first off, I just want to say your affiliate marketing idea is really smart. Let's say you get a referral fee from a company like a construction company or someone who sells something and they give you 20% because you brought it. Many companies operate at a 20% profit margin. Mm -hmm. So you're getting 20% without having to actually do any of the building of the business. Yeah, I love affiliate marketing. So a lot of the listeners, they're in one business and they refer people to another. And there are often regulations and laws that prevent you from profiting. But if you're doing it legally, that is a business to so refer business to someone else's business. So there you go. I, it's really right. smart of you to be able to do that. As Dave, far as Dave is my cheerleader, if you haven't noticed. Love my that. Cheerleader. And one thing I, I think that's really cool about all of this is you're talking about just one of the many kind of, I like to call them kind of ancillary businesses that spin <clears throat> off of our real estate businesses, right? As real estate investors, we have so many yep. other opportunities to create multiple streams of income by doing yeah. spin-off businesses. So that's really fun. Uh, what about you, David? What types of things have you been working on in your real estate business or businesses in 2020? So my real estate team had its best year ever, and we can get into that in a little bit. Like, su was super awesome. I finally figured out a lot of the moving pieces that I was struggling with in 2020. It was a great year. And then I started a mortgage company, and that's doing really, really well as well. Like, really good as well. Might have been a better way to say that. <laughs> I, it's doing good. English good. So uh, mortgage and real estate are obviously very tied together and the success of one is is uh, dependent on the success of the other one. So that's been another really good business that I started. Uh, I have got into the short-term rental market game. So I'm in Hawaii looking at those right now. I uh, raised some money for flip projects. I did several of those. That was another source of income for me. Um, I wrote a book that's going to be coming out uh, early next year, but I did the work for that this year, and that that is a form of a business. And then I also recommend people to a um, success uh, coaching sort of a, a group where people who want to learn business principles to get either their investing business off the ground or perhaps like a different business that they're running. Um, I'm doing the same thing Brandon's doing where I'm pushing people into that. 
That's Love awesome. This. So I, cool. I, I, I have a quick question. Well, not even a question. I, I want to give you an opportunity because I think your book is now available for pre-order. So let's let's uh, get the name out there and where can people go to pre-order the book? So you can go to biggerpockets.com slash new books. This is a little like hack for all the listeners. If you want to see the books that BP's working on, but they're not out yet, you can go to biggerpockets.com slash new books and you'll find them there. My book is called Sold Every Real Estate Agent's Guide to Building a Profitable Business. And it's meant to be the first in a three-part series for how new or inexperienced agents can actually make money doing what they're doing. And then the next book will be how to make a lot of money as a top producer. And then the third book will be how to build a team. That's awesome. And so uh, I guess another little teaser, we're going to have you back here in a couple of weeks to talk all about that book and all about the concepts in the book, which is essentially how as a real estate agent, you can build a successful brokerage or a real right. estate agent business. So uh, look forward to having you back. Everybody keep your eyes out for that in a couple of weeks. I want to go back to Brandon. So, and, and I'll give you each a shot, but, but Brandon brought this up, Brandon, you said you've learned more about business this year than at any time previous. So I'd love to hear in more detail. What, what, what did you learn? What are the, what are the big takeaways? What are the things you didn't know before that you know now? Yeah. And I'll even say it maybe like learned is the wrong word. It's more of applied the things that I, I like we all know and that I didn't do. Uh, and a lot of it is is based on an analogy that you I can't remember what book I first heard this in. Uh, but the, the Dr. Oz analogy and maybe you guys have heard it before. It's the idea that, you know, Dr. Oz at the height of his crazy busy schedule of like he was had like a couple magazines. He was on Oprah. He had his own TV show. He had all this stuff going on. He was still doing like 200 open heart surgeries every single year. So the question was, well, how could Dr. Oz do that? That was crazy, right? It's because like he was an uh, he was like the world's best guy at a certain cut. Like he did this cut that he went to school for. And he trained. He practiced for years and years and years. He got good at his cut. So he would walk into the operation room. The person's already opened. They're already cut open. They already got everything ready, clamped, hoses, everything. And then he would go do the cut and leave. That was his job was to do the cut. That's what he could do better than anybody else. And so what I determined this year, and I've really, really put into practice is what is my Dr. Oz cut? Like, what is that thing that I should be walking in to do and everything else should be already clamped and cut open and, you know, the blood all moved away. So what it, what does that look like? So for me, a lot of it has been like taking the stuff I already did, things with bigger pockets, things with the podcast, and really zoning in on what are my superpowers? Like, what are the things that I have to do? And for me, a few things. Number one, uh, the podcast. The podcast is probably the most important thing I do from a that perspective, right? So like, if the podcast didn't happen, I'd have a hard time with Open Door Capital raising money or bringing in team members, things like that. Uh, the podcast also makes the affiliate marketing stuff work out. Uh, podcast ha- helps me sell books when we do. But I also wrote a book this year, earlier in the year, and that's one of the things I do. Also, writing is one of my core things. So those activities, I really focused in on them. And when I look, I actually just had a conversation with my wife yesterday. I said, if I look at my my calendar, my schedule these days, like. I would say 90% of them are core activities. They are Dr. Oz cuts, 90% of what I do today. A year ago, I would say 90% of them were not Dr. Oz cuts. So it's very That's a huge shift, very huge different. shift. Yeah. So I want to dig more into that, Brandon. How how do we, as business owners, like, first of all, how do we determine what our thing is, what our cut is, or what that one super special major superpower is that we have? And in the past, in 2019, 18, 17, before, what are the types of things we can do to really make sure we really go full speed ahead on that superpower and let everything else kind of circle around it? Ooh, that's a good question. All right. So I would say the best way to know what your Dr. Oz cut is, is a couple of things. Number one, ask people around you. They can typically recommend, like they typically can see the cut in you better than you can see it for yourself. Uh, Because you kind of make like, I mean, yesterday I actually told David this. I said, when I see David on the phone with a client talking them off the edge of wanting to quit a deal, it is like watching like Houdini do a magic trick. It's, It's unbelievable. Like David is like the guy with this thing, right? Like. He, he just knows how to do it and it's light and airy. He gets off the phone and he hangs up and he doesn't even think about it. He just goes back to the conversation we were having. And I'm like, you don't know, you just like flew. Like I just watched you like fly across the stage and he's not even going to acknowledge it. Like, because it's so light and easy. And so this is a, so number one, ask people around you, what do they say you doing? Number two, does it feel light? Does it feel heavy? Things that like things, I want to focus on things in life that feel light. Podcasting feels light. I mean, like 
we jumped on the show with like no prep work, right? I mean, like on my side, you guys prep a lot. But like, I just jump on here and I just talk. Like, this is not hard for me. It feels super light. Uh, David's the same way. Like, podcasting is light for him. Uh, writing is actually pretty light for me. So those things, what feels light versus feels heavy, you know what doesn't feel light to me? Like, if I'm uh, got to make a phone call to go to the doctor, that sounds like the most heavy thing in the world. Like, if I'm like, oh, I got to talk to somebody on the phone. Like, it's just, <laughs> it drains me. And I will wait sure. weeks to do it. I have been waiting weeks. I need to go to, like, a chiropractor. And I just don't do it. I'm just like, I have a sore back all the time. And I'm like, I should go. I don't want to call. So leaning into that. And then one final note. Uh, things that you procrastinate on. Procrastin- procrastinate. Am I saying that word right? We'll go that, works. Oh, that works. You'll, okay. figure, you'll figure, figure it out later. We'll figure it out later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> took me a minute David yeah that was good uh, yeah so uh, uh, Dan Sullivan we interviewed him on our podcast recently and he said the things that you procrastinate about are the things your soul is saying you shouldn't do Yeah, and I thought that was really good so it's a good indication of what you shouldn't do because you're procrastinating at it the things that you like wake up and you're like this sounds awesome today that's probably a, a, a core thing but kind of those three I'd, I'd throw it out anything you want to add on that DG I think that uh, Brandon and I have, through the mindset podcast we've been doing, what we've really found is that the future of business is teams. Really, building a business is a form of building a team. Even getting your your real estate investing business off the ground, we're constantly saying you have to build a team. So both learning where do I fit in on a team, that's like what's light to me, and how do I find others that will fit in on my team which is usually the stuff that feels heavy to you and is light to them are two crucial skills that I think people need to be focusing on going into 2021. I I love that. And I love the whole idea of the cut. And just to put a kind of a finer point on that, uh, I often talk about find that thing that you're the highest and best use of your time in terms of how much money you're going to make. And the Dr. Oz example is perfect. Think about how long he spends doing that cut. Obviously there's Mm -hmm. prep time. He spent years and years and years getting great at it. But these days, how long does he actually spend suiting up, washing his hands, getting in there, making a cut, getting out, and how much money does he make? That probably results in something yeah. like ten or fifty thousand dollars an hour that he's yep. generating for a cut. So what is that 100%. thing that you can be generating if you're currently generating fifty dollars an hour or twenty five dollars an hour in your business? What are those things you can be doing to take that up to seventy five dollars an hour or a hundred dollars an hour? Look, I love to negotiate. I think I'm a pretty good negotiator. But in our business, if we want to make an hour, I let Carol negotiate because I know in 10 minutes she can save us $10,000 in a negotiation. That is her superpower. And so in our business, that's what she does. No matter how much I love doing it, no matter how good I am at it, that is her superpower. So she does it. And then I go do my superpower. And if everybody, just like you said, finding, building teams that are really great at different things, find the people and use their superpowers so that you get a deal done in a tenth the time because the people that are doing the work all are so good at it that they're spending a tenth the time as any other team would do. You know what feels super heavy to me? What? Negotiating. Hate it. (laughs) Hate it. I just, I hate it. I'm like the real estate guy, right? Like I I hate negotiation. So like I literally like right before this call, I had a call with my virtual, uh, my virtual assistant who's a uh, a lady named Belle. She lives in Seattle. And I said, I said, hey, I really want to get a massage more often at my house. This is a, a different topic, but I'm a big believer in taking time to think, but I will not do it if I'm not obligated to do it. So I've learned to obligate myself to things by, for example, having a personal trainer come to my house. If I have to go to the gym, I won't do it. But now a guy's at my house, I'm obligated to do it. So I'm like, I'm obligating myself to take time off with no phone, no nothing to think by getting a massage. Massages are fun anyway, they feel good. So now I have a lady gonna come to my house and give me a massage, but I don't, like, I wanna do one for me, one for Heather, and then I'm gonna do one more for my team. So for example, like, like we'll book out for three hours, she'll come to my house and I'll get one, Heather will get one, and then one member of my team here in Hawaii will get one every, so it's like rotates between them, there's like three or four people in Hawaii. But I don't wanna pay, you know, 350 bucks every time, every week for this. I'm like, we should be able to get that down to like probably half that, because we're repeat customers, it's a, it's a three hour block, right? So I just called my assistant, Bell, and said, hey, will you do me a favor and call up, you know, like this lady, the massage lady, and see if you can't negotiate that down significantly. And she's like, oh, I would love to. And so she's going to take care of it. So I've learned that is to, yeah, let people do their cut, and I'm going to do my cut, and I'm, and I'm 
That's where I'm, that's what I learned. And, and it's and and, and and part of that is it's worth paying for it. So even if you yeah. are paying three hundred and fifty dollars now, this goes back to the um, bringing in people that can do the things that otherwise won't get done. I, I mean, we always talk about you'd rather bring in somebody, give them half the profits to do something, yep. because fifty percent of a big number, or fifty percent of something, is better than a hundred percent of nothing or a hundred percent of a small number in your business. You got to bring in those people. Brandon, you talk about hating to pick up the phone. I don't pick up the phone. I can't do it. I, Carol, who, who makes my phone calls? Me. Yeah. Me. I make the doc, <laughs> yeah. like every doctor's yeah. appointment, boom, yeah. let's go. I, I, I yeah. literally wrote my first book because I couldn't stand people calling me and saying, hey, I have questions for you. Can I take you to lunch? Can I, can I pick your brain? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, I don't want to talk. Let me write a book just so you can get the answers and not have to talk to me. So, and somehow you became a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Again, Amazing. Yeah. Mind boggling. But this is easy I'm for so me too. I, like, that's it's it's one it's totally different like what we're doing right now is for some reason totally different than if i were to pick up the phone and call you jay i mean you know how hard it is for you and i to even connect the last couple weeks we've been trying to and we got one call in but like it's hard because we're just not phone people but this is easy yeah we obligated ourselves to being here there you go it's the the obligation yep i also think there's another element of this that the listeners can really benefit from because when you're we often hear i'm sure jay and carol you guys get this a lot too how do i get a mentor how do i get a mentor the reason that Brandon and I became friends, in my opinion, is when we first met, he was, you're pretty big in this space, and I wasn't really that well-known. I didn't have as much to offer you as, as you, you would me to fat? in our friendship. No, you did call me fat, though, when we first met. That's <laughs> I did true. not call you, you fat. You could get away with that because no. you were a somebody, and I wasn't. But the reason that I I think, simply said you were wearing a pajamas at, at a hotel in the middle of the day. And it would look good if I got better clothes and lost 30 pounds. That's how that <laughs> I don't think I said wait. I think you added that in when later. When we get to heaven, God will tell you. you <laughs> But I don't mind, okay? Because here is, I knew Brandon cared about me, and that's why he said that. The way that I think you knew I cared about you was I jumped in and did stuff that I could tell was heavy for you. Yep. We went to a Go Go Abundance event. I knew you don't like being around people you don't know. I just put you on my hip and took you everywhere, and I introduced yeah, you to much. everyone. Every, and that's where we became good friends. Yep. When we were driving out in the car, my first trip to Maui, your contractor was kind of jerking you around a little bit, and I could see the whole, oh, I don't want to negotiate with this guy. And I just took the phone out of your hands and said, hey, I'm Brandon's uh, project manager. And I did everything, <laughs> and the guy was like, yep, I'll be there Tuesday. That's it funny. sounds good. And you were like, oh, I love this guy. Yeah. There's a principle there for the people who are trying to figure out how do I get a mentor. If you know what your superpower is, your cut, and you find a person who doesn't like doing that, that's a much better way to get into a relationship with that person than saying, can I take you out for a cup of coffee and pick your brain? And I just wanted to highlight that, that not only does it benefit us to know what our superpower is, but it benefits the people that want to be in a relationship with us to know what our superpower is and what it's not. Yeah, totally true. that's really great. And let's talk more about these, you know, other people, other people out in the community. Clearly, the two of you with all of the people you talk with, with all the people wondering how they can shift their mindset, how they can find mentors, how they can find deals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you just got to know what's going on, right? You see lots of trends. Mm. I'm curious, what are a lot of the trends or at least a few of the trends that you've seen other real estate people, other business owners, things that they've done, big accomplishments they've had, maybe some over overall struggles they've had, particularly as they relate to 2020, just some overall trends from the community that you two have seen come up over and over. I think one big one is people got in the habit of looking for a property and saying, does this work or doesn't it work? And when there was not as much competition for properties, you could be picky like that. And now that everybody wants to buy a house, investors are now competing with regular primary residents, homeowners over the same deals. Fixer upper, that person needs a house so bad, there's so little inventory that they're going to jump on it. They're going in with 5% down. You got to be at 20% down. You have strict criteria to hit. They just need a roof over their head. You're losing. So what Brandon and I have sort of done pivoting both in my real estate agent business and in our own businesses is looking at a property and instead of saying, does it work or doesn't it work? Saying, how would it work? Yeah. And then does the time, energy, and money that I'd have to put into it justify making it work? And if it's too hard, then we let it go. But if it's not, then we go another level deeper. So maybe taking that three-dimensional approach instead of a one-dimensional approach of just a binary yes, no, I think that's been pretty big in 2020. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree 100% with that. And I'll add on a couple quick thoughts. Number one, I've noticed a trend. I don't know if you call it a trend, but I've noticed that most people I know with a positive mindset have had the best business year they've ever had. Not all of them, but many, many of them are having just a phenomenal year. 
And I know a lot of other people who have more of a, to use like Carolyn Dweck's like fixed versus growth mindset from her book mindset. Like people who have a fixed mindset, meaning like it's just, it is what it is. Like they've had like the worst year ever. And so it's amazing how like 2020 was such a dichotomy of a year in that it was either the best year for, I mean, for me, it was the best year ever. Yeah, I mean, me too. Yeah, it was by un- far. Yeah, it was, it was unreal. Now, again, some people did, like naturally got hit hard by the recession. Some industries got hit hard and thankfully mine or whatever you call this year, not a recession, but by the pandemic. Luckily, mine didn't really uh, in that like mobile home parks did awesome and we're at, you know, 99% occupancy or whatever it is, you know, like, of our rentable units. So that said, there was a mindset thing that, that really was shown this year. It's kind of like gold is refined by fire. You know, you put it through fire and gold is purified and made and made like that's how they make gold. They put it through a really hot process or a chemical process uh, to refine it. This year was a refining year. I think it's maybe a good way to put that. And so it refined, like, do you have a, do you actually have a business? Uh, now I would say the stock market, it has not been one. This has been a just crazy year for like, I'm not a stock guy, but like, it doesn't make sense to me, like why the year has been doing what it has been doing. Uh, and so like, I think the refining year is next year for the stock market. Personally, I could be wrong, but yeah, for business, I think this was a good refining yeah, year. Yeah. I, I think it, it reminds me a lot of 2008 in real estate. Um, people, a lot mm-hmm. of people look at 2008 and say, wow, absolute worst time in history to be buying real estate. But let me tell you something. The people that are saying that are the people that weren't buying real estate in 2008, nine and 10. The people that were actually buying it, that, that were able to do it successfully, it was an amazing couple years. I look back and and it should have been an even better few years. Um, and it really goes to the point that when you know what you're doing, when you have experience, when you have discipline, um, that what looks like what, what looks like may not be an opportunity could actually be a large opportunity. There are a lot of people that have struggled in business this year, but we and and anybody that listens to the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast knows that we've had a lot of guests on since March who have done an amazing job of pivoting. They've done an yes, amazing yeah. job of being flexible. They've been done an amazing job of, to, to use a ridiculous cliche, taking lemons and turning it into lemonade. And it was mm-hmm. the same way with real estate back in 2008, 9, and 10. A lot of people were struggling, but those that had the ability to really pivot and, and were smart about taking what the economy was throwing at them and using it to their advantage, we're successful. And likewise now, the people that are taking what all, all the crap that the economy is throwing at us and know how to t- harness that, um, it really gives them an edge. And, and so I, one of the big things I tell people now is be flexible and don't be in a rigid mindset. Don't think that there's only one way to do things because those that are creative have, have been really successful this year. I, I would. Oh, go ahead, Carol. Oh, no, I was just going to add on to that. And then I would love for you to, to piggyback on this. I just wanted to add, in addition to being flexible and this whole pivoting and making lemons, it's a lot of what both David and Brandon talked about a little bit ago in this show, just all these different types of businesses that you've spun off of your core business, right? We have talked to so many people that because of the need to be flexible, to have that correct mindset where they just need to do something different and figure out, you know, not say how this isn't going to work or how is it going to work, but what are we going to do to make it work, have spun off and created whole new streams of business that weren't even a thing prior. And that's another thing I wanted to ask both of you is, have you seen any like particular shining examples that really stick out of other people that have, have had their core real estate business and again spun it off into something bigger better different just overall just new and awesome you want to start? Uh, uh, myself is probably my best example i've now seen okay we're doing real estate sales now i can do mortgages and now i can control the quality of service that the client gets as well as the product i'm going to start a solar business in 2021 so for people that want solar panels we can work that into the analysis that we're already doing and say well your electric bill is x if you buy solar it's y does it cash flow does it come out profitable for you to do this and if so here's a solar expert that can help figure out the person that you need Um, that type of thinking i haven't seen as many people adding like bolt-ons to their business, I've seen more of what you guys mentioned earlier, the pivot. Like, okay, it's not working to do the same thing. Let me try something different. The point I wanted to highlight about what you're saying, Jay and Carol, and why I love everyone who's listening to this podcast is you're showing that you have the growth mindset, the pivot uh, approach to business, is that you are here trying to learn, how do I need to adjust? 
And I was thinking about as Brandon and I are getting jujitsu lessons, the instructor will show us, Hey, here's what you do. And then, uh, we uh, inevitably come to a point where it doesn't work because the other person figured out what to do to stop it. There's so many people who see that in business and go, Oh, well, I guess my business doesn't work. This is what I was yeah. doing. Something changed. It doesn't work anymore. I guess jujitsu doesn't work. The more you know about it, like our instructor, he's like, well, then you got this option, this option, this option, and this yeah. option, right? And if he does this, then here's a bunch of branches. So when he's actually in that match, he's never anxious. He's never worried. He's not losing sleep. He's not in that horrible emotional state you get in where somebody moves your cheese and you don't know how to find it again. And so what I would recommend is if you're feeling that, you're a white belt. Right. When you move into understanding business principles, business concepts, you're like a black belt in that space. You don't really ever feel that anxiety. So listening to these podcasts, talking to other people helps build that knowledge base up. And what I've found is when you're comfortable in those scenarios, you don't worry. My guess is the reason probably, Brandon, you don't love negotiating is that you don't know what the other side is going to throw at you and you don't want to have to figure out that problem. You don't like the conflict that might come from like, we're going to be butting heads or yeah. whatever. So that's not something you want to become a black belt in. That, and I just really like people. And so I always like negotiate for them. I'm like, oh no, yes. no, no, you take a little bit more, take a little bit more. <laughs> like, that's, yeah. It's like, no, no, tap them. me out. I want you to feel how yeah. it feels to get right. Yeah. So like yeah. that wouldn't be the great thing. Whereas Jay and Carol, they love the feeling of, of coming up with a solution that worked for both parties because they were able to use their own intelligence to get there and making money out of that deal. So they naturally, because they love it, focus on how to be good at it. They're drawn to understanding, okay, I'm going to do A, they're going to do B. I'm ready for that. I'm coming at them with C. So I, I think more than anything, understanding that if you're feeling anxiety or if your business didn't do well in 2020, you had the approach of, oh, well, that didn't work. So I guess I'm not good at jujitsu or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I that resonates with me because I see a lot of people that are not doing well, who are focusing more on the tactical aspects of business and less on the strategic aspects. Basically, 2019, they 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 planned out their 2020. This is what I'm going to do in my business. I'm going to follow this marketing path, and I'm going to hire this person. I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And then 2020 comes, and be, be, best laid plans, I mean, starts, <laughs> yes, starts yeah. punching you in the face. I, who was it? Mike Tyson, who said, everybody has a plan yeah. until you get punched in the face. Yep. Um, 2020 yep. punched us in the face, and half the people said, okay, well, my plan's not going to work. Okay, I'm going to wait until 2021 when COVID goes away and I'll start over with my plan. The other half say, okay, I got punched in the face. My plan's not working. Let's go back to the drawing board and figure out a new plan. Um, so I, I, I definitely resonates with it. I do want to ask you a question, David, though, because um, you were talking about your brokerage business. You're obviously doing really well. You wrote a book on it. And then you just mentioned your mortgage business. And we haven't talked about mm -hmm. that here, but you started a mortgage business earlier this year. And then in the same sentence, you talked about a solar business that you're planning on starting. So I know a lot of people out there, um, they're kind of in the same boat. They're like, okay, I can, I can do this adjacent business. I can do this adjacent business and this adjacent business. What is your advice to those people to help them decide what is the right adjacent businesses mm -hmm. to start? When is the right time to start those businesses? And when is it wrong or, or just it's too much? That's such a good question. And Brandon and I talk about this all the time because we are very big proponents that you don't want to what we call build multiple bridges to the same island. You don't want 12 different businesses completely unrelated to each other that you're trying to work on them all at the same time because it's like building a bridge from California to Hawaii. You'll never get there with 12 of them going at the same time. On the other end, you want to be flexible. You want to be able to add new opportunity. So here's, here's the best way I can describe how to know if you should or you shouldn't. When we interviewed Tarl Yarber on our podcast the last time we did it, he described how he went from flipping houses to the Burr method. Now, why this was so amazing was the process of acquiring houses under market value, rehabbing them to make them worth as much as possible, the crew that you need to do that, the analytical skills, almost everything for 90% of that process is the same. The only difference was the last 10%, the disposition. Do I put it on the market and sell it and get hit with capital gains taxes, or do I refinance it and keep it? Might be a slight difference in the rehab process if you're rehabbing a house to get top market to a regular buyer or to turn it into a rental. 
But he had so much success because he didn't have to build a new business 100% from the ground up. He just had to fix the last 10%, which was basically go to a lender instead of go to a real estate agent. And it worked really good. That's the type of bridge you want. It's all the way to Hawaii. It's just the last 10% of your bridge shoots off and goes to Oahu instead of Maui. So with the solar company that we're talking about, I don't have to go start a completely new business. I already have a CPA that's really good that knows how to start a C Corp or an S Corp or whatever I want. I will tell him my goals. He will come back and tell me what type of of, uh, business that I want to do. I already understand, like, I won't need to go hire a whole sales staff. I will find a person that already understands solar, like anyone listening, if that's what they wanted to do, they could hit me up. And I will say, look, here's how your role is going to fit within my business. I'm going to hire someone to go make me a PowerPoint presentation so we can explain how the whole thing works. We're already sitting down with our clients and saying, here's your mortgage, here's your expenses, here's your options. If you're house hacking, here's the rent that's coming in. We're already doing a numbers analysis. This is just a tiny little thing that we're adding on to say, one of your expenses is going to be your utilities. Here's how solar would or wouldn't help you. And I don't have a whole new marketing budget for this company because it's the same people that are already coming into my other businesses. My clients are going to love it. They don't have to go find a solar person, wonder if they can trust them, weed their way through all their different options. We've already simplified it. The person who I'm working with is going to love it because he's got leads coming or she's got leads coming right in. I'm going to love it because it's an additional source of revenue. And then as word gets out, more people come in. It's very, very easy to add this onto the bridge I'm doing. I would never say, I'm going to go start a dog walking company. That That's completely different. I have to start from scratch and build the whole thing. So maybe if you guys could sum up what I'm getting at there, that would help me. I know that was kind of long winded, but that's the the matrix that I run through. Let, let, let me sum that up for you because I, I like this. Here's I'm, I'm going to do David Green's The King of Analogies, but I'm going to try one here. It's kind of like you can say, hey, it's dinner time. What do I want for dinner? I want lasagna for dinner. Okay, I'm going to have to go to the store. I'm going to have to buy the noodles and the sauce and and all the stuff for the Mm. lasagna. Or you can say, I have a refrigerator. I'm going to open up that refrigerator. I'm going to see what ingredients I already own. I already have right in front of me. And I'm going to figure out how to take those ingredients and make something that is going to work for me. Yeah, 10-minute dinner versus a two-hour dinner. There you go. Beautiful. That's really that's a good analogy. That's a better analogy than David Green usually does. That's, that's impressive, Jay. Love He's it. just Love hungry. It. It's really that simple. <laughs> <laughs> Not giving way too much credit, people. Come on. That is you, that is usually the answer. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I want to pivot a little bit. Let's 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 pivot towards twenty twenty one. Um, so, uh, I know Jay Papazan, somebody, I think you guys have had on your show. We've had on our show talks about the one thing and yep. focusing on something for the next five or 50 or a hundred years. But, um, and, and I'm one of those people that says, Hey, if you have the ability to focus on one thing for 30 years, you are a better person than I am. You should do it because you'll become the best in the world at it. Um, but I think the four of us, we, we like doing different things. We like branching out. And um, so my guess is that 2021, you guys probably have some some plans to do additional things. I know, David, you mentioned the solar company. Is there anything else in 2021 that you guys are looking to branch out into or, or do that that's different or new? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. The First of all, I think that the idea of being a one, the, here's how I translate the one thing to, to my life. My one thing is actually not real estate. My one thing is not affiliate marketing or writing books or being an author or being a podcaster. My one thing is being a general in a war. What I mean by that is if you think of a war, there are a lot of battles to fight all over the place, but the general of the war is not fighting in those battles particularly. So the one thing that I can commit to for the next 30, 40, 50, 100 years is to being a general of my life. In other words, being in control and and issuing commands as needed for things to get done. You can move around the world all you want to different locations, different battles. So that's how I translate the one thing. So I'm, and I really feel like this past year I've gotten better at that and I want to continue doing that in 2020. Now, more specifically, uh, with Open Door Capital, we have found that we are very good good at raising money and bringing in top talent and reaching a lot of people, mainly because of my position on the podcast, right? It's a huge position to be in. And I'm very lucky and blessed to be there. So as such, there are simply not enough mobile home parks to satisfy our hunger, if that makes sense. Like if you think about it, there's only 50,000 mobile home parks in the country. Out of them, to go large enough that we'd want, there's probably like two or 3,000. 
There's so not gonna, enough marinara sauce in the fridge. There's not enough marinara <laughs> sauce in the fridge. <laughs> yeah, so we are looking at different options and we are very methodical about how we're looking at them on what that means. How can we use the ingredients in our fridge to, and I'm the mobile home park guy, I've been talking about it for a long time and I still love them. I love, 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 love them. But how do you, it's really getting tough to buy a billion dollars of real estate in mobile home parks because there's not that much to go around. So uh, in 2021, we're going to be doing a slight pivot, not a crazy one, uh, but we're going to be adding on a little bit more. Most likely that's going to be multifamily. I think that's where we're all leaning towards. Um, And then utilizing the skills and the superpowers that I have, uh, namely being on the podcast to get other people to go out there and find multifamily and to partner with other teams because the thing that we do really well we can raise money. We can reach a lot of people. We have that influence. So that's what the superpower our team should be working on. Uh, and so that's that's what 2020 looked like for us. But what about you, David? That's a really good question. So what I learned this year was... Thank you. I came up with it myself. <laughs> <laughs> in 2019, I sold 46 homes. In 2020, it's going to be a little over 140. The difference is when I was at 46 and I had to explain everything to every client, I could only do about 40 to 50 properties. That's how much time I had to be the person explaining to the client why the deal would work or what deal we should go after. This year, I had more people on my team that I I trained four of them or three of them, and they had those conversations, and we triple or quadrupled our production. And that was what I realized. I My one cut would be teaching people and pushing them to a standard of excellence. I want to raise the standard of how we serve our clients on how we save them money, on how we get them deals, and really how we handle conflict, because that's a part of business. And then I want to coach and teach people up to that higher standard. I'm a firm believer that if you want to be more successful in anything, whether it's martial arts, fitness, reading books, writing books, running a business, it starts with raising your standard, and then the success will come to you. Like that, Everyone's looking for the hack. How do I, where's the great deal that I'm going to find that I don't have to work for? But the truth is you raise your standard for lead generation or your standard for how well you analyze a property or how you can rehab it. And then many more deals make sense for you than they would for somebody else. So what I'm looking to do is find more people that are coachable, that I can raise their standard, get them up to a higher level of excellence that clients are thrilled to work with. So there can be 10, 20, 30, 40 of me's instead of just one of me always dealing with clients. So what that will look like in practical steps will be having a David Green team expansion into Southern California, into Hawaii, into probably areas where I think Californians will be moving. So I think a lot of of Californians are moving to Nashville. They're gonna be moving to Florida. Right, So I go to the markets where I think many of the people from here are going to leave, and I put a David Green team and a Keller Williams over there. And now I can connect you with an agent who understands our training, our teachings, our systems and that you can trust. So that's what my big challenge is going to be, is finding those people, hiring the right ones, pouring into them, getting a system of education built around both the lenders, the real estate agents, the solar people, all the different little divisions that we have, and both increasing their, their, uh, their standard as well as their knowledge. Awesome. I love this. And it's so clear that both of you have spent a great deal of time, resources, energy, and discussions with your existing teams and how you're going to be moving forward into the new year, right? I mean, this isn't just something you're making up on the fly. This is very consistently uh, delivered throughout your messaging. So there's a ton of time and work that's been put into it. My next question for both of you is, what about for those of us or other community members who have not yet really, maybe we're the procrastinators, the people who we've had a lot going on, we have a lot of ideas marinating, we're mm. still a little bit overwhelmed, but we're really looking forward to what 2021 has to offer, right? What are a couple tips that each of you have to just get us started on that goal setting process? Like, What is the very first thing we should should be doing to get on that path of what we want to do to achieve something new and great moving into the new year. Yeah, I'm I'm a big believer that people oftentimes think that life is about let's use an analogy. You're on a beach and you have one of those metal detectors and you're trying to find the hidden treasure or the hidden whatever coin somewhere on the beach and you're like looking all over. In other words, they're like looking for their destiny. What do I do? What's the right thing for me? What's the best path? 
What I always try to reframe that to people is like, remember that we are not on a beach with a metal detector. There's not one hidden treasure out there. We are an artist. We are sitting in front of a gigantic white easel, you know, our white piece of paper on an easel. And we have a bunch of paintbrushes in our hand and we can paint anything we want to paint. Like anything you want to do, you can do. And so in other words, expanding the idea to like, rather than what's right for me or what should I do is answering the question, what sounds amazing? And because there's a million things you can do. And so just what sounds amazing? Like, like just start there, like answer that question and start just brainstorming. What sounds amazing? What sounds amazing? What sounds amazing? And when I did that, I was like, you know what sounds amazing is like having like a team of like four or five people that were all like people that I really liked a lot. And we hung out in the evenings and weekends and our kids played together. That sounded pretty amazing. So I started there. Like that's literally how Open Door Capital started was with that thought of that sounded fun. Okay, well, how do I afford four or five people? How do I afford those salaries? Well, I have to build a business. I can support that, right? And I, what what ingredients do I have in my fridge right now? And and I just kept building until I came up with like the vision, which you can kind of see behind David if you're watching the YouTube. It's not, you can't really see it because it's all whited out, but it's like a four foot poster. And I think we talked about that when I was on the show last time, but this idea of the vision or the, the vivid vision. And so uh, I painted a very clear picture of what I wanted. And it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't really matter that much. As long as it sounds awesome to you, it'll spur you on to a great 2021. So if you have like, let's say you're a franchise owner and you're, you own a McDonald's somewhere and you're like, you know, what sounds amazing? Well, you know, it'd be really great to be able to take three months off later this year, just completely take three months completely off and just go to like Switzerland for three months. Okay. What would it take to have that? Like paint that picture. I'd have to have a general manager to be able to control, you know, manage my store. Okay. So what's that look like? And you just work backwards and paint this amazing picture. And now you got a really clear outline of where you need to get to. And then you can implement that into, you know, systems and, and like, Check, you know, I'm going to get this done in quarter one, this in quarter two, this in quarter three, to be able to get there. But I think a lot of it just begins with that vision. David? I don't think I can follow that. Okay. <laughs> it's amazing the number of things in business and investing and in life where the answer is work backwards. Yeah. Start with the end in mind and work backwards. And, and I think it's a, it's a great reminder. Okay. So... Uh, Let's say we do that. Let's say I create all my goals and I have a vision and I know exactly what I want to start doing. And then I do what so many people do and I create my New Year's resolutions. Yeah. I am going to go to Switzerland and to do that, I'm going to hire a general manager and to do that, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And then January 4th comes around and up, oh, I skipped a day and January 5th, mm. well, I already missed one day. I think I'll just take off another day. And before you know it, July comes around and you've forgotten about those New Year's resolutions. What can we do? Because um, I know, Brandon, you we've talked about this. Um, what can we do as mere mortals to overcome? And actually, when I say we've talked about this, we haven't talked about this. I listened to you do a podcast um, with somebody recently where you talked about this. Um, so I I'll apologize. You, sure. The yeah, 12 go week for year. it. Go yeah, for well, it. Well, I'll, give, I'll, give you four, I'll give you four things. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. There's really like four things I think a person can do to stay persistent. That's what we're talking about here is persistence. I don't think any of us don't believe the following fact. Like if you stick with anything long enough, you're going to succeed at it. I mean, I, I had a, we talked about this when I was, I think with you guys a long time ago on your show, but I had a wooden sunglasses business one time. I was selling wooden sunglasses. I thought it was a cool idea and it was a cool idea, like wooden frames, right? They're neat. If that was four years ago now, I think five years ago, if I would have stuck with that, I would have been successful right now at wooden sunglasses. I know I just gave up after like six months. Um, so I think we all know that persistence is the key here. So how do you do that? How do you build persistence? So by the way, I looked up in the dictionary the other day, persistence, because I was giving a talk to some group. And persistence is defined as the act of persisting, uh, <laughs> if, if, you, if you didn't know. So that's that's the definition. Uh, the other one was to persist. Those are the two definitions given for <laughs> persistence. To persist or the act of persisting. Um, it sounds like Jocko's definition. <laughs> it does, yeah. Right? How do you work harder? You work harder. <laughs> yeah. How do you not quit? You, you don't, don't. You don't quit. Yeah, you just don't. Um, all right. So here are four things. Write these down, everyone. Uh, number one is to establish a morning ritual. We all know this, but we just don't do it. Most people. So a morning ritual, which includes, uh, I'll say three parts of it. Number one, write down what your goal is. Number two, write down why it is. Actually, four parts of that. So write down what the goal is, why you want it, uh, what your goal for the week is for that task. And then what your daily uh, your daily goal goal is, and I'll even a fifth piece of that one, and what your most important next step is. So I just work backwards from like like what's the goal? I want to take three months off. What's the why do I want that? Because I want to deepen my relationship with my spouse and to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Um, 
my weekly goal this week is to get out the job listing for the general manager I want to hire for. That's my week. I want to get the listing out on monster.com and LinkedIn. Great. Today, what am I going to do? I'm going to write the job description. What is my most important next step? M-I-N-S. What is that most important next step? The most important next step is I'm going to go to Google and type in general manager franchise job description and just see what comes up and get a, a couple definitions. That is a five minute task. So first of all, everything in life, almost everything can be broken down into a series of five minute tasks. It's amazing. Like literally building a nuclear bomb is a series of five minute or less tasks. Everything in life can be divided down into five minute or less tasks for the most part. Um, so that's, that's the first of the four. So the first one is establish a morning routine where you do those five things. Number two, uh, I'm going to say number two is get a performance coach. I think having a performance coach, somebody that you meet with regularly, not talking real estate guru coach, whatever, but just having a person you pay regularly to hold you accountable to your goals and to your, to yourself helps pull you out of the biz, out of your life, right? We all talk about business, like work on your business, not in your business, work on your life, not in your life once in a while. And a performance coach helps you do that. Uh, number three is, is, is build through community, stay persistent through community. This is why bigger pockets is so huge is because people get involved in BP and they start trying to build real estate, uh, a real estate portfolio together. And it's amazing what happens because you are the average of the people you associate with. So you're, you're hanging out with people that you surround yourself with, uh, whether that's a mastermind group, whether it's a, a professional organization that you're involved in, whether it's just like a, a accountability group with three, four other people, find a way to use community to keep you persistent. And uh, let's see, that was three. I had a fourth one. Hmm. I don't know what it is. If I think of it, I'll tell you, but <laughs> those, are, those are the three big ones. We'll say those are the three big ones. That's awesome. Uh, morning ritual, get a performance coach, build communities. Yeah. There you uh, go. And, and that's great. So do you have a coach? I do. Yeah, I got a coach. His name is Jason Dereez. He's awesome. And we meet twice a month and we've been doing so for four years. And yeah, it's been great. I, I want to talk about this for a little bit. So we're, sure. we're nearing the end of the show, but I think this is an important topic because this comes up so often these days, um, finding a mastermind group, hiring a coach. Um, I'd love to get your take on what should your expectations be when you hire a coach? I mean, I know a lot of people, their expectation is, yeah, they're, they're going to make me successful. I, all I have to do is give them money and then you know, I'll, 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 I'll be a billionaire <laughs> in five years. Clearly, that's not the case. What's yeah. the work we need to do and be prepared for before hiring a coach? And then how do we go and find the right person? Yeah, that's, it's tough. Um, I mean, I'll start with the last question. How do you find the right person? I think it, it largely comes down to referral and, and who, like, who you know that knows you really well. That would recommend it. So, like, I was recommended my coach from a, a bigger pockets uh, guest we had on the podcast, uh, and who just said, "Hey, like I mentioned, yeah, I really need a performance coach. I think it'd be helpful." And he's like, "Oh, talk to this person," because he had done wonders for me. That's what the guy said. And now I've recommended my coach, Jason, and I'm actually an affiliate for Jason. Like, I get a little kickback or a little like you know recommendation. Now, I, I swear for anybody listening right now, like, don't you don't have to tell Jason at all that I recommended you. Just just sign if you're gonna go with him, sign up with him. Don't tell me. Like, I'm not saying Jason because I get paid from him. Uh, but like, it's been phenomenal for me. So talk to people who have had experience with somebody, uh, it can be a great way to find that person. Now, what kind of, what kind of work do you have to do ahead of time? I'll, I'll say this. And what does a coach do? Uh, I have a list. I actually made a list cause I was getting, I was giving a talk to a group of people about performance coaching and I made a list, but the main thing they do is he, is he reframes my thoughts. So I, and calls me out on my crap is like the, a good way to put it. Like every time I say like, this is a problem I'm struggling with, he literally just asks questions. That's all he, like our conversations are like me talking for 55 minutes and him asking questions for five of those, you know, for five minutes in there. It's just like, well, what's another way to think about that? Well, I guess it could be this way. Why do you think that way? Why, why are you against that? Well, I guess it could be this way. So it's, it's like almost like therapy more than anything. Uh, and that's been super helpful. Uh, and, and again, a lot of people are thinking, well, do I really need a coach? Just remember like Michael Jordan has a coach. I had a coach, right? Uh, Tiger Woods has a coach. Uh, the world's top performers, all of them have coaches. They have several coaches. Yeah, several coaches. He's got for a every workout event. coach, yep. a shooting coach, yep. a defense coach. Yeah, Tiger Woods got a different guy that helps him with putting than the guy that helps exactly. him with his drives. Yeah, so they, they, they point out the things that you don't see. So, I mean, I know, David, you're a big performance coaching fan as well. What about you? Yeah, so my performance coach is really a psychologist, and he's really, really good at like what Brandon said, calling you out on your BS. I would say what, what I use him for the most is, Hey, I want to do this. This is, I'm not doing it. 
And he'll say, well, let's talk about why you're not doing it. And I'll be saying, well, it feels heavy. Or he'll help me get to the bottom of the emotional reasons why I'm not engaging or I'm not showing up the way that I should be. And then he just hands it to me and he's like, well, here you go. I like I'll share the last thing that we came up with was I was hiring people and keeping them on way too long when any objective person would say you got to let them go. And I just kept falling into that same trap. I was trying to coach these people up all the time. And he finally helped me get to the the root cause, which was when I was young, like five, six, seven years old, my dad really didn't put a whole lot of effort into teaching me anything. He was just always disappointed. So I was trying to shield every human that I met from ever feeling that shame that a six-year-old would feel when their, their parent doesn't like them or isn't proud of them. Subconsciously, of course, I had no idea that's what was happening, but he really dove into it, pulled it out and said, well, here you go. And then uh, it was a quick realization like, well, they don't have those issues. They don't want to be shielded from pain. They're sort of choosing to select out with the effort that they're giving. And if it wasn't for that, I'd still be hiring people and giving them way too much time. So I use that coach. He's expensive. He's $500 an hour. And I do twice a week, one with the real estate team and one with the mortgage team where we all get together and we talk about the challenges that we are having in the business, either with each other, the feelings we're having. I'm not getting paid enough. That person got an opportunity I didn't get. And he and his wife mediate all these very difficult conversations. So what I found was that I would know this person's not happy. They're resentful about something, but they wouldn't come tell me. So I would just avoid giving opportunity to them and I'd give it somewhere else and they'd see that the resentment would grow. By the time we actually had the conversation, it was ugly. And I recognized, man, you get these people involved where people feel like safe and comfortable sharing on the team what they're feeling. And we're taking these mountains and catching them at the molehill face. And it was super smooth. So even though that's a really expensive thing, it does wonders for the team chemistry, for the individuals on the team. Now, all of you know the crap that he's figuring out with me he's, and his wife, they're able to help the other team members too. So they're all getting performance coaching in that sense. And like Brandon said, there's people in your life that may play that role. Like Brandon plays that role for me sometimes. He's really smart, but there's things he's going to miss or, <laughs> or there's times where he just doesn't have the time to put into that. So a coach is someone who's like, fully engaged in you and getting to know you and your goals. Yeah. Uh, real quick on that point, just I would say the performance coach thing, I would say is more important than the accountability group, but if you can get both, get both. Yeah. And, and you talk about it being expensive, but here's the thing, what they're doing, we, we use the word coach. And when we think of coach, we think teacher, um, but a great coach is more than just a teacher. A great coach yeah. is finding the blind spots. They're finding yep. the mistakes yep. you're making over and over and over again. So maybe, yeah, maybe they cost $500 an hour. The thing that they're going to fix isn't just going to fix $500 an hour for you. It's going to fix $500 an hour over and over and over and over. Uh, I guess the best analogy here, I used to play professional poker. And in the poker world, we had this term called leak. You have a leak in your game. And a leak is this thing where when you play professional poker, you're only winning like 1%, 2% of what you're betting an hour. It's a very small edge. You win very little money. Um, and if you have one or two little problems in your game, what we call leaks, let's say you play a certain hand too often that you shouldn't be playing, or let's say you bet a little bit too money, too much money on other hands that you shouldn't be betting on. These are things where you're going to lose money, not just one time, but you're going to lose it every time you play that hand or mm. every time you play against that other player. And if you play this hand 50 times over a week, you're going to lose money 50 times in a week. And if you can plug that leak, as the terminology goes, you're going to be making money or not losing money not just once, but 50 times a week. And, so a great, and a great coach is doing the same thing. They're plugging those leaks in your business and personal game. They're fixing those things, those mistakes you're making over and over and over again. And when you stop making those mistakes, that the success compounds. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, when we talk about $500 an hour, $500 an hour is nothing given the fact that, that they could make you millions by fixing those little problems that will cost you millions over the next five or 10 years. And I, well, just that one issue with me was $4,000 a month that I yeah. let drag on for six months. And there you go. You know, and I think another thing would be the leak we have between our ears. Like everyone in 2010 that was nervous to get started, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars did people lose not buying real estate before? That's right. That's right. Carol, what were you going to say? 
I was just going to say, listening to all three of you, gentlemen, one common theme that you've all talked about over and over through your performance coaches is they're not just good at holding you accountable. They're not just good at sitting there spitting out motivational stuff. It sounds like the key to a really successful performance coach is helping you garner insight into your whole entire life and really letting that permeate into your business, into your, per- into your personal life, and really help shift how you move forward and just approach, again, not just your business, your personal life and everything kind of rolled into one. So I think it's yeah, just it's a, definitely, it's a point. Yeah, performance coach is not just about... It's not just about that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not about just business. It's it's everything because every like, if your life sucks, your business is probably going to suck too. Mm-hmm. That's if, right. If your business sucks, your life's probably going to suck. So, well, business is the act of solving problems. That's what business is. I can solve this problem, and and how well or how poorly you do it or how profitably you do it. That's what business is. So, if you're if you can't solve problems between your own ears, it's very difficult to then yeah. go solve problems for your clients. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're nearing the end of the episode, talking about insight, solving problems, looking forward to moving ahead. Would love to hear from each of you some great insight you have for our community as they move into 2021 to make it the best year they've ever had Mm. and celebrate the successes that have happened this year and make it even better moving forward. What do you have for us? I would say I'm a really big fan of pursuing excellence before you try to strategically pick out the first place to be, right? Like even when it comes to investing, after you've done it for a while, the analysis of a property as a new person feels like the only thing that matters. And then the longer you do this, the less, I mean, we analyze properties, but we do it much more quickly and we are more comfortable with not with the variables that are involved. When you're new, every variable is terrifying for you. So what I've found is that if I pursue excellence in whatever I'm doing, I don't worry as much about the things that I can't control. A confidence comes and then a momentum starts to build and every problem is easier to solve when you're hitting it with momentum. So people need to start there. If in your personal life, where do you have leaks? In your business, are you? do you believe in your own heart I am so freaking good at what I do that I deserve to be a millionaire or I deserve that promotion. Or are you just doing the status quo, waiting for someone to come along and tap you on the head and say, hey, I think you're great. And then you believe you're great. So it starts with you got to believe yourself that you're good. And most of us, if we take a hard look at ourselves, know we could do a lot more. We could be a lot better. We could be more dedicated. We're just waiting for someone to give us permission to do that. Hey, you have permission to be great. Stop that. Start right away saying, I'm going to chase greatness. Then you're going to hit hurdles. That's where a coach comes in. That's where a friend comes in. Hey, why am I having such a hard time with this piece? Why am I not doing better when it comes to this? Plug those leaks. What I've found is when you see somebody who's doing that, even if they have a lot of issues somewhere else, it is so attractive when you find a human being doing that, that you go looking for them. And One of the things I've noticed, Carol, I don't know if it's the same for you, is that with the people that are trying to become successful, they're constantly saying, how do I find opportunity? But then those of us that like have companies, we're constantly saying, how do I find talent? There's a huge gap between these two pieces. So you got to have faith that if you build it, they will come. If you pursue excellence, there's people out there that are going to see you and grab you and go plug you in the building. I think one of my favorite things that Brandon said all year was when we were interviewing Dan Sullivan. And he had Ben Hardy write the book, Who Not How. And Brandon said, Ben didn't just wait for someone to say, hey, do you want to write a book with me to learn how to become a good author? Ben was pursuing, how do you become good? He had written books himself and he earned the right for Dan to say, hey, I want you to write my book. So are you waiting for the person to come and say, hey, do you want to be an author? And now you'll put your effort in. Or are you putting effort into what you do with the belief that that opportunity is going to come? I would say that that attitude will create an empowered mindset that will feel really good going into next year. Love it. Thank you, David. Phenomenal. And let me also say that yeah. episode with Ben Hardy uh, was last week or two weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, was absolutely awesome. Loved, well, loved, thanks. loved that episode. Thanks. Uh, okay, your turn, Brandon. Give us you some repeat, motive. Yeah, repeat that question. Yeah, yeah. Going into 2021, people want to hear your best piece of advice, your best piece of motivation, whatever you got to uh, to really supercharge our community and each of the people in our community heading into 2021. 
All right, so David went into the the clouds, and I mean that in a good way, like the high level, like big picture. I'm going to go a little more tactical on the ground. Implement a management, uh, I guess, operating system within your business this year, if you have not already. Uh, so whether that's like EOS or 4DX or one of the million other ones that have, books have been written, like EOS is from Traction, 4DX is from the book, Four Disciplines of Execution, something to align your team around goals and who gets accomplished, who's going to accomplish what, who takes ownership of what, what big things get done. It's like, there's just a process and EOS is probably the most popular uh, with traction. My company is doing uh, full EOS implementation right now. Bigger Pockets is doing full implementation of EOS right now. And it is game changing, like how much less work I do and how much more at peace I am about things because I know everything is being handled by a system. And so too many entrepreneurs are out there acting like entrepreneurs and they just start acting like they own a McDonald's and um, an operating system that runs your business is a good way to do that. So if you haven't read Traction, read Traction. That would be my advice. Love awesome. it. David, David, last question real quick. Give us a book. So Brandon just mentioned Traction. What book should we be reading that we probably haven't read yet? In line with the answer I gave, I'd say so good they can't ignore you. Yeah. Cal Newport. Yeah. Super. Gentlemen, awesome. thank you so much for all of your insight. As always, it is such a massive pleasure to chat with you both and so looking forward to an amazing 2021 together for all of us in our community. Thank you so much for Let being here. Let me just here. tell you guys, thank you for doing this podcast. Of everything Bigger Pockets has going on, all the new stuff, this is my favorite piece of it. Because I feel like a lot of people come to bigger pockets to learn real estate investing, but what they're really looking for is financial freedom or a better job. And real estate ownership is not the only way to get there. For many people, what what you guys are sharing is so much more valuable for them individually. So I'm a huge fan of this podcast. Everyone listening, if, if you love people, share this with them because real estate is business. And business principles will absolutely improve your life. So just thank you guys for starting this podcast this year and for sharing this empowered message for everybody who's looking for a better life. Aw, thank you. David, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And we look forward to having you back here in a couple of weeks to talk about your new book, to talk about the businesses that you are building and to get some amazing advice for our community, for the business, for the businesses they're building. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody.